Okay. Yeah. On Instagram, Greg's here. Hey, Greg. You can't. Oh, I'm sure you probably heard that. I don't know. This is not good. Nope. <laughs> Oh, don't cool down. Shh. <laughs> you want to hear about my banana bread? Yeah. My mom just joined and said hello. Hi, Patty. <laughs> Come around here. Let's leave him alone. Come on. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate you guys signing in and joining us. Uh, this is my first time doing this here on Zoom. I'm. Uh, Basically what I do here with the, the strength coach tutors that I provide one-on-one -on -one tutoring for uh, students or anyone trying to prepare and take the uh, certified strength and conditioning specialist exam. And, you know, combination of my experience in terms of teaching and studying to taking for the exam, uh, try and help them and guide them the best way I can. Um, and part of this too, kind of reason why I want to start off doing a lecture like this is uh, I definitely find a bit major weakness in terms of like people usually don't have a good understanding of kinesiology and anatomy of the whole entire body but i figure you know let me just do a general overview of the foot ankle and lower leg to get started and see where things go all right so uh thanks for hopping on and uh let's get started here so again we're going to talk about kinesiology of the foot ankle and lower leg but of course before we actually go into some of the kinesiology stuff we're going to go over the anatomy all right so as you can see here we have uh, the ankle slash the foot, all right? So two of the major bones that we have um, in the ankle, so to speak, are gonna be the talus and the calcaneus. So our calcaneus is what's commonly referred to as our heel bone. You can see it better here on the left-hand picture here uh, where it says calcaneus. So that's the major bone that's comprising our heel. Sitting directly superior to it or directly above it is the talus bone, which you can see directly right to uh, the calcaneus here in the left-hand picture. All right. Another uh, decent sized bone here that's directly in front of the calcaneus and the talus here is going to be the navicular. And you can see how it interacts with the calcaneus and then directly lateral to it is the cuboid. And again, this is a, a left foot that we're seeing here in these pictures. So uh, the inside of your foot is going to be on the right side, which is also termed the medial side. And on the right, I'm sorry, the left hand side here, we have uh, the lateral aspect of the foot where our fifth toe would be. All right. So again, we have the navicular and the cuboid up front here. And then as we keep going distally um, towards the front of our foot, we have the medial, intermediate, and lateral cuneiforms all kind of in a row there. And directly in front of them and the cuboid, we have our metatarsals, which are these long bones that, that begin right before our toes. And then we have our phalanges, which are the small little bones here that comprise all of our toes. Okay. Um, and you'll see that some of these guys have stars here. So those are what we call the tarsal bones. And so seven, um, there's seven tarsal bones in our foot and ankle, all right? Lower leg is a lot easier to look at. Obviously we have a lot of little bones here in our foot and ankle, but as we look at the lower leg, a lot simpler, right? So we're not, we're looking at everything pretty much below the knee. So in the lower leg, we have two bones that run parallel to one another. Medially, or on the inside of our lower legs, um, we have the tibia, which is commonly referred to as our shin bones. So if you ever bang your shin or got kicked in the shin, whatever it may be, uh, we, that would be your tibia, okay? And then on the lateral aspect, or on the outside of our lower legs there, we have our fibula. And you can see that is significantly smaller and thinner compared to the tibia. We do a lot more of our weight bearing um, through the tibia, you know, a lot of our weight and stress that we experience throughout our body gets placed through the tibia rather than through the fibula. Okay, so let's discuss the joints here, as this is uh, what's really important to us when we're gonna start talking about some kinesiology here. So in reality, uh, if you're just looking at the ankle for the most part here, because this is where we're gonna see a lot of our movements um, and activity that we're gonna talk about. Of course, we have tons of several little joints throughout our foot and toes and so forth, but we're gonna mainly talk about the ankle here for the most part. These first two joints is what we'll really be spending a lot of time on. So we have the talocrural joint and the subtalar joint. So the talocrural joint is what we primarily know as the true ankle joint, okay? The true ankle joint, the talocrural joint, is where that talus is articulating or connecting with uh, the bottom aspect or the inferior aspect of the tibia. So you can see 
in that circle there, it's where the green is interacting with the red there, that first piece of red, which is going to be our talisman. All right. Um, and that, excuse me, that's where uh, plantar flexion and dorsiflexion are going to occur. And we'll, again, that's what we're going to go over here in a little bit. So subtalar joint, subtalar, so sub kind of sounds like it's below something. Talar sounds like the talus. So subtalar is going to be directly below the talus bone. So it's really, if you look at the right hand side here, we can see the talus bone that's in red and then the calcaneus is going to be directly below it in white. As you can see, that calcaneus is a lot larger compared to the talus, but that articulation or connection between the talus and the calcaneus is what allows us to do inversion and eversion uh, of the ankle. And then the last joint here that we'll talk about, we really don't see a whole lot of movement here really, but technically it is a joint because it's an articulation between two bones. Uh, we have the inferior tibiofibular joint. So that's where this, uh, the inferior aspects of the tibia and the fibula come together and connect and articulate with one another. All right, so now let's go into compartments here and where uh, some more of our musculature is gonna occur. So our lower leg is divided into four different compartments. And each of these compartments has a general muscle action uh, associated with them. So if we look at the, let's start off here with the anterior aspect. So the anterior muscle group is the muscle group that's directly uh, lateral or to the outside of your shin, okay? So generally speaking, all the muscles in that compartment are going to help you dorsiflex or bring your ankle and foot upwards. Directly out to the outside of that or lateral aspect of your lower leg, um, what's in green there on the picture there, that is going to help you evert your ankle or bring it to the outside. Uh, posteriorly, so behind uh, in the back of your lower leg and what's that big blue area, that's going to be your uh, posterior group and that's, those muscles are gonna primarily help you plantar flex your ankle or point your foot downwards. And then in the red there, that's gonna be actually deep or underneath that superficial posterior compartment. And those guys are going to help you primarily invert your ankle, okay? So you can see here that there all these little like, it looks like little separations in each of these groups. So those are the actual individual muscles that are comprising each of these compartments. So as you can see here, the biggest group is the superficial posterior compartment. Those little two round ovally shapes that my cursor is over right now. Those are the two different, uh, the medial and lateral heads of your gastroc muscle or your calf muscle. And then directly beneath that is where your uh, soleus is. Okay, so you can see that this group is the largest out of the four, as thus we do use our calves significantly in a lot of athletic activities and just things that we do about our um, daily habits and routines and so forth. We rely on our calf musculature a lot to uh, just do what we do on a daily basis. Um, and they are also capable of providing the most force, but we'll go into that here a little bit further. So let's keep moving on here. So let's go take a better look at some of these movements here. So again, let's go back to that talocrural joint, which we refer to as the true ankle joint. So with the true ankle joint, we, we're gonna experience plantar flexion and dorsiflexion. So if I play this first video here, as you can see that when the foot goes up, that is when we dorsiflex our foot and ankle. And then when our foot is pointing down, like as if you're doing a calf raise or stepping on the gas pedal, that's where we're gonna uh, perform plantar flexion, okay? Now, if you look on the right-hand video here, remember in the subtalar joint, that's where we're going to do inversion and eversion. So inversion is where we uh, have the bottom of our foot facing uh, medially or towards the midline of our body. So when my foot moves inward, that's inversion. And when my foot swings outward like that, where the bottom of my foot is almost facing away from the rest of my body or laterally, that's an example of eversion, okay? There we go. All right, so a little complex piece of this is uh, pronation and supination. So pronation and supination is a bit more than just kind of, it's another way of saying eversion and inversion. Inversion and eversion are definitely included as part of the motions involved with pronation and supination, but it's not the whole picture. All right, so when someone pronates their foot or if someone has flat feet especially, uh, they're in a combination of these positions here. So they're in a dorsiflexed, eversion, 
and externally rotated position. Now the rotation components a lot of times are where the foot is being positioned in reference to the uh, tibia, but a lot of times to the tibia, you'll see when I play this video here, experience rotation as well during these movements. So pronation looks a lot like when you're, uh, you don't have, you have flat feet and your arch is completely in contact with the ground. But supination, you're gonna be in a plantar flexed, inverted, and internally rotated position here. So this is where you're gonna see ha uh, someone have more of a arch shape under their foot. So let me go ahead and play that video for you here. So you can see is when the arch or the gap pops up under the foot, that's when you're gonna be in a more supinated position. And when you're in a pronated position, that's when that arch there is gonna be making more contact with the ground. Now, sometimes you might hear uh, this be referred to as open versus closed positions. Uh, typically, in terms of pronation, we're gonna refer that to as an open position, meaning things have a lot more give and you don't have as much stability in that position as because things are not stabilized very well. So there's a lot more movement and a lot more um, instability in that position. Whereas if you're closed and you're in more of that supinated position, things are more locked up, your muscles are more tense, the bones in your foot are more um, articulating more so with one another. So that way you're in a more stabilized position. Uh, you don't do as good of a job of shock absorption. So especially like if you're landing for a jump, landing in that position isn't always ideal, but in terms of creating stability, it's a great position to be in, where if you need to do some storm of uh, shock absorption, you're gonna be able to, you wanna be able to pronate so that way you can not put as much stress through your bones and let the muscles and tendons and so forth do the work. There we go. So another concept I wanna talk about here is the windlass mechanism. So this has a lot to do with our plantar fascia. And our plantar fascia, a lot of people probably have heard it before, maybe plantar fasciitis. Um, the plantar fascia is a structure that runs from our heel all the way through and towards, up, towards our toes here. And, and um, what it helps do is really help stabilize the bottom of our foot to help strengthen all the arches in the bottom of our foot. All right, so the blue line is there's kind of meant to show in the left-hand picture there to show the length of it. Um, and that blue joint there is trying to show the axis point of all of our uh, metatarsal phalangeal joints or our major toe joints in reality, okay? So in that position, when your foot's flat on the ground, it's in a relatively normal position. It's not being stretched, it's not being shortened, it's just in a normal position. But in any instance where we go up on our toes, where our toes are extended like that, whether we're about to jump, we're about to go take off to go sprint or run, whatever it may be, that um, the plantar fascia lengthens, meaning it gets more taut in that position. All right, so when that plantar fascia lengthens, it gets taut, and then what we want that to do for us is to give us more stability so that when you go ahead and push off, you've got a stable surface to push off of rather than if something's weak and lengthy and has a lot more give to it, you're gonna you know, not produce as much force as efficiently. So it's important that, as you can see here, when you get into this position here, when your toes are in extension, you can see that there's a little bit more of an arch created, especially for someone like me who has more flat feet. You want to be able to create an arch like this so that way when you do go ahead and push off, you have that stability to produce force efficiently in an effective manner. Because if you don't and you can't lock your bones up and almost think about getting into more supinated position, if you will, um, you're just not going to be able to move as quickly and explosively. Okay, so let's talk about some exercises here and just look at the difference between uh, some of the requirements for the foot, ankle, and lower leg uh, with different movements that we see quite often here. So if you're looking at the, uh, just a regular squat, you can see here in the right-hand side picture of both of these exercises. So we have a back squat and a deadlift, right? So in a squat, you can see how um, you need a significantly more dorsiflexion compared to doing any sort of hip hinging or deadlift type of movement, right? So if you look at the squat, we need significantly more dorsiflexion compared to if you look at the hip hinging, your shin doesn't move forward up too much, right? So when we squat, our shins have to move forward uh, really to help distribute our center of mass, but also just to get out of the way for the rest of our body too, right? So in order to move our shins forward, we need to be able to have it translate forward by having enough dorsiflexion, okay? Whereas so you can see with the hip hinge, we don't, all the movement's really gonna be occurring at our hips. There's not too much bend in the knees and there's really not too much going on in the ankles either. So you can see we need a significantly more flexibility in the gastroc musculature and in our Achilles tendon compared to um, having to perform a movement like 
an RDL or a deadlift, we don't need as much movement in our Achilles tendon or gastrocnemius. All right, similar concept here when we're looking at the forward or reverse lunge. Again, you can see with the lunge position, our shin does move forward quite a bit, maybe not as much as compared to a squat, but you can see that there's still a significant amount of dorsiflexion required to be able to form this movement effectively and make sure that our heel doesn't lift up off the ground as we're performing this movement or our knees go past our toes, you know, anything like that. Now, I think what's interesting is that a lot of times we look at a movement like the lateral lunge and say like, oh, if you can do a lateral lunge, great, you know, we, and we're kind of just focus on the leg that we're putting most of our weight on, which is the our lead leg, the leg that's stepping away from the rest of our body here. But if we look at this trail leg, like I am in this example here, people often neglect the mobility uh, requirements to perform a movement like the lateral lunge or even your defensive stance and side shuffle in any athletic activity, right? So if you look here in that right picture for the lateral lunge, there is significantly, or I'm sorry, you need a significant amount of inversion to be able to get into that position and lean like that, right? So, you know, a lot of times, again, we're looking just at that lead leg. You need some dorsiflexion for that lead leg, absolutely. You need to be able to stabilize yourself and balance, but with that trail leg, it still needs to be able to invert a lot if you're gonna keep it on the ground, right? And if you're gonna be able to really take a wide stance, the wider you go, the more inversion you're gonna need in that trail leg angle. Okay, so this last example here that I have for you, kind of like a jump shot, obviously it got some low ceilings here, so I'm not jumping the highest as I, of course I could, nor can I jump that high, but that's besides the point, right? So let's go ahead and look at this. So if you look at, the jumping motion, right? When we go ahead and leave the ground and in the process of jumping, we're gonna do significant amount of plantar flexion. So I'm gonna go ahead and try and pause that. So if you look at that picture there, right? Look how plantar flexed my ankles are. They're going straight down, right? So we need a significant amount of plantar flexion in order to be able to, you know, really finish strong and create a lot of power for this movement. But then as we land, let me try and get it here. You can see as I'm landing here, I still need that dorsiflexion to do some shock absorption, right? And again, remember, I want, when I'm trying to absorb force when I'm landing, I want a little bit more pronation, right? So that way all the force is going to my muscles and my tendons rather than the bones and joints in my foot, ankle, and lower leg. Now, when I go ahead and take off, I want a little bit more of a stabilized position, right? So that way I can create more force, force efficiently and effectively and ideally jump higher. I want to be in a little bit more of a supinated position, but I do, in reality here, I'm not good at doing the supinated position just because I do naturally have flat feet. Again, not the end of the world, it's just part of uh, what it is, what it is. Um, but here, as you can see, as I'm doing landing, again, part of that uh, pronation component, I need a lot of dorsiflexion in order to um, get enough shock absorption so that way I'm taking the stress off the joints and bones and putting on my muscles and tendons, right? So as you can see here, my knees are going forward, my shins are angled forward. I need a lot of dorsiflexion here in order to be able to absorb this force efficiently, right? So go ahead and just watch that one more time. So again, a lot of plantar flexion at the top, a lot of dorsiflexion at the bottom. There you go, cool. All right, well for you guys, that